Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening as well. This is Joseph Trevisani from Worldwide Markets. I'd like to thank you to the webinar, this morning's webinar, this day's webinar. Um, I'd like to thank FX Street, of course, for cooperation in putting these webinars on. And welcome. Um, today's topic, rather grandiosely, is To the Barricades, the French Revolution. Oops, the French election. A very appropriate slip of the tongue on this. Um, this election in France is probably the most momentous election, at least in the potential for what might happen uh, since the Second World War. France, since the war, has been at the heart both of the planning and the support for the idea of a federal Europe was not how the plans were laid out in the beginning, or at least not how, and not how they were spoken about by it, their supporters, but that's certainly the case. Starting with the coal and steel pack in the 50s, moving through the common market, moving through the Maastricht Treaty, moving to the Schergen Zone, the idea of a federal Europe was a project of politics. It was not primarily, initially, and originally a product or a project of economic integration. What do I mean by that? Because what we've seen over the past 20 years, the past 15 years, has been a project of economic integration, where the planners and the proponent of proponents of the European Union have used economic integration, primarily the euro, to foster the growth of the the union. What we have seen, however, is not a ever closer union, but is more and more division seeping in to the center at this point of the European Union, France. If the European Union was not designed for economic integration, what was designed for? Well, it was designed in the 21st century to avoid another 20th century. I can't think of any continent. Oh, I don't know. I, I suppose we could go back to the Mongol invasions uh, sweeping through Russia, China, and then um, the Islamic Caliphate in Baghdad in the 13th century. But short of that, I really can't think of, I suppose the Thirty Years' War might qualify, um, but that was in the 17th century, and it was such a horrible experience for the Europeans that there was never another continent-wide war. There was not another continent-wide war until 250 years later, in the 20th century. The two world wars, or as Churchill called them, a new 30 years war from August 1914 until May 1945 with a 21 year interregnum in the middle. I think it was uh, Marshall Foch who said after Versailles, very famous quote, this is not peace, this is an armistice for 20 years. The Euro, the European Union, is designed to prevent that from ever happening again. And as an ambition and as a goal for populations, peoples, and politicians, and political systems that lived through or suffered through the first 45 years of the 20th century, it is an admirable and altogether necessary goal. 
But as is the way with things, the world moved on. And there hasn't been any sense, and maybe we are premature in this, but there certainly hasn't been any sense in Europe post World War II of the revival of the passions and the hatreds and the militarism of the two first world war the two first the two world wars europe's essentially demilitarized it was protected from the soviet union by the united states voluntarily but also in everyone's best interest including that of the united states and it has no need, it has had no need to provide for its own military defense. I would contend, of course, that the idea that the world has outgrown the need for military forces is unfortunately not true. So the European Union was designed to promote the idea of European Union. Its goal and its model was the federal nation of the New World, that is the United States. Now, the disparate cultures in the United States are not as deep as they are in Europe. We at least speak the same language, more or less. Also, as Churchill said one time, about England and the United States separated by a common tongue. We fought our civil war here, and it was over a very substantive topic, slavery. The, even now, it would be difficult to say what the First World War was actually fought over, despite the horrendous casualties in the central nations of Europe. And the Second World War was very clearly fought to reverse the verdict of the First. Yet for the First World War, there's almost no really good reason comparing it to, of course, the American Civil War, if you will, to say what that war was over. A distortion of the balance of power politics taken to an extreme and given, gifted, if you will, with the powers of the Industrial Revolution, which no one knew what they could accomplish in the field of military and killing at that point. Well, they soon discovered that. So to avoid that topic, that topic, excuse me, that history, running from that history, the EU was born. In its concept, admirable. Admirable in a way that all endeavors such as the EU, just like all of the peace treaties during the interregnum between the wars um, that outlawed war, that outlawed weapons. They did all sorts of wonderful clauses, wonderful words, signed by everyone, none of which meant an iota of difference to governments when they started to move in a different direction. The undeniable truth that was ignored by those treaties, that has been ignored by the UN, that was thought antiquated and arcane by the idealists behind the EU is that not even in democracies, but more only in democracies, but more so in democracies, you cannot ignore 
even if you do not think they are worthy. The desires and emotions and identifications of a nation's people. In a very mild example, we have the last election here in the United States of Donald Trump. Now it's true that Mr. Trump lost the, just, just as an example of what we're talking about, it's true that Mr. Trump lost the popular vote. But to give you an idea of what the actual tenor of the country is as far as who it wanted as president, rather than specific areas, if you remove the largest state population is California. If you remove the California margin of victory for Hillary Clinton in that state, which I think is about three million voters, but I'm not 100% sure. So if you keep, if you make California a 50 50 split, then the rest of the country voted rather overwhelmingly by democratic standards for Donald Trump. So as a reflection of, that includes New York and the Northeast as well, as a reflection of the will of the country, it would certainly seem that Donald Trump had as good a claim to it and better probably than anyone else. This is aside from the fact that everyone knew how the electoral college system worked before the election and nobody complained about it. So that aside, you cannot ignore the wishes of large segments of the population in a democracy. And this appears very much to be what the EU is very guilty of. The warning signs have been there for years. The cultural question is what is the group, the largest group, that the members of a nation of cultural unity in France simply is defined, I suppose, by speaking French. In Germany, Germany and Italy by time, simply as a linguistic group, I realize it's imprecise to say the least. Just based on that, what is the largest group that people feel a loyalty to? And the group is, as we've seen, and is recurring again, it is the nation state. Brussels and the EU was fine until it started to play with and supersede and order around, if you will, nation states and by default their people. The EU's attempt, well, let's backtrack a little bit. The European Union, by and large, until the Euro and really until the financial crisis, delivered a run of benefits to its citizens. Nations wanted to join, nations did join. The trouble began with the euro and primarily with the, at least it became illustrated, by the, uh, the financial crisis, which made everything which made all of the negotiations and all of the terms of the 
treaty, the master's treaty and others, the former UN made it evident how dangerous they really were. Up until that time, what had happened? Well, the Europeans got a customs union, which pretty much benefited everybody. They got a lot of much easier and eventually uh, borderless travel within the, within the European Union. Not realizing at the time, because it had not been tested, remember, the institutions of the Euro, the, the, the ones we want to talk about that have actually impacted European citizens. First is the Euro. And you don't know how successful it is until it's actually tested. And it was never tested up until the financial crisis and in the years subsequent, which are now almost eight years since then. The shirt and free travel zone was never tested until the Syrian civil war. And now it has been tested. And it has failed the in many in the minds of many people in Europe. It has failed much apparently as the idea of a liberal parliamentary democracy has failed in Turkey with the weekend vote. What does that reflect? I don't know, but I have a feeling we're gonna be doing a webinar on it shortly. Um, at any rate, Turkish democracy may have gotten an extra generation. It was formed about the same time than the Soviet Union did. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll have to investigate it. So, both of the EU policies, which have the most impact on the individual citizens, the free travel zone and the euro, were fine until tested. And now that they've been tested, the European view of them is very different. The English never adopted the euro. And I'm sure at this point they're very glad they didn't. Um, but their view of the Shergan Tree Savile Zone was just judged to be a failure. And that's why the British are leaving. Whether or not the Scots follow them, I think, is something we'll have to wait to find out. I have my doubts that they will. And despite the uh, desires of the First Minister and uh, other rulers in the uh, Scottish National Party who are, who are ruling in Edinburgh. And now we are seeing on the continent itself these same issues, the issue of immigration and the issue of economic integration and who does it serve and how, are not just bubbling to the surface, they are running at a roiling boil at the center of the European Union. Of the three nations that you could put at the center of the European Union with the three largest economies, Germany, France, and Italy, two of them have large, active electoral movements that are essentially anti-EU. At the center of the European Union, despite 70 years, or however many years you want to put it, of integration, of rhetoric, of planning, of leadership across the board by all elites in all countries, certainly in the three countries that we're mentioning, Germany, France, and Italy. Every major politician, until very recently, supported the EU, supported economic integration, supported Brussels, supported the ever tighter, un ever closer union, and supported the euro. In less than a decade, we have seen the rise of powerfully anti-integration parties, movements in France, in Italy, 
in the UK and a nascent one, but not to be mentioned, in Germany. Just as a brief aside, um, one of the things I think you will see, there was a time, post Maastricht, when the all aspiring European Union members, both included and pending, it was clear to everyone that the program included adopting the euro. Um, except for some very small accretions, uh, Malta won. My guess is that the writ of the euro stops at the eastern border of the EMU, the European Monetary Union. I do not see the economies or the nations of Eastern Europe, the old Soviet empire, the near abroad, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, as candidates to join the euro. Relatively speaking, some of those countries, Poland especially, have good economies. None of them on the scale or the integration or the penetration of the countries of Western Europe. Nonetheless, they are about uh, the same distance from the end of the Soviet Union as Japan was the number of years from the end of the Shogun era and the Meiji Restoration. A little bit further along. I was thinking of the Russo-Japanese war on that, but it's a little sooner. So these nations are probably not going to join the euro. It's clear to them, at least it's clear to me, and I'm assuming it's clear to them, I'm going to have to examine this topic as well, that the euro is not beneficial as currently constituted to the national economies of most of the EU. This is a topic which has been ignored in European circles. But as I said, at one time, it was assumed that automatically Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and others would automatically join the European Union at some point as soon as their economic statistics, statistics converged. Of course, one of the problems with that is those rules were made by France and Germany, and as soon as they became the rules for debt and other outstanding debt. The things as soon as it was inconvenient, they abandoned them while enforcing them on others. And they too proved to be totally inadequate to face the economic payout of the financial crisis and the recession in 2008 and 2009. So the rules don't apply to the others. But behind that is the problem. We've spoken about this before, and I'm not going to deal specifically with the idea of cultures today. And eventually I'm going to return to the candidates in France and just give you a preview. The astonishing thing that we're seeing now is of the five major candidates running in France, Marine Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron, Francois Fillon, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and Benoit Hamon, forgive my French pronunciation for anyone who is out there, is that two of them advocate Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Mélenchon, I think, advocate either conditional or immediate departure from the EU and the Euro and perhaps the EU. And their votes represent well more than 40% of the population. In fact, 
There was only one candidate in the in the race, the former um, center right. I mean, former leader or tied with uh, Le Pen, Francois Fillon, who has suffered a number of scandals about having his family members on the public payroll, I believe, is, no, excuse me, aha, my list is a little different here. Um, there's only one candidate, Emmanuel Macron, who is advocating as part of his electoral approach to accelerate EU integration. Le Pen is specifically against it. Mélenchon is, um, hold on a second here. I'm just gonna bring up one more. Um, let me make sure that we have all of the listed here. Okay, if you have any comments or questions or anything you'd like to add to it, please just type them into the first video and I will uh, take a look and we'll talk about them. Um, I'll be glad to go pretty far afield on these questions. It's rather a large topic. So only Emmanuel Macron um, is advocating to accelerate EU integration. Nobody else is taking that point of view. Now, we're, we're going to come back to that in a minute. The problem for the EU is a simple, well, it's not so simple, but a distribution of benefits. The euro, the most widespread and obvious accomplishment of the Union is seen by many of its citizens as a detriment. What do I mean by that? Well, France and Italy, and of course Portugal and Spain and Greece, their economies have, have been sidelined to a great degree by the euro. Even the euro, as you can see in the chart here, has come off rather powerfully since the financial crisis. The euro is still far stronger than would be warranted, than would be warranted as a national currency by the economic strengths of these countries. And what is worse, it has permitted, until very recently, many nations in Europe <clears throat> to borrow at credit ratings and at costs unwarranted by the economic and financial strengths of their own country. We all know this is, def this is true of Greece, and we saw the result. It is now running on four years or more. Similar thing has happened in Italy to a lesser degree in France. So in addition to restricting imports, I mean, restricting exports by pricing them too high because the currency is too strong. It has also permitted local governments, national governments, to run up far more debt than is a good idea for their countries. And now, of course, they have to service this debt with reduced earnings. Employment and wages have stagnated in some European countries, not Germany, but France, not Germany, but Italy, and have plunged in others, such as Greece. 
They are also stagnant, more or less, in Spain and Portugal. It's not a matter of whether the prior to the euro perennial devaluations in the Italian lira, lira were a good idea, or were something that should be viewed upon as the way to run a country, if you will. That doesn't really matter. What does matter is the way that the Italians managed their economy, and they are no longer able to do that. Youth unemployment, youth being, if you will, below 30 or even 35, is astronomically high, 25% and rising, in many of these countries, in Italy, in Greece, Greece is much higher, Spain, Portugal, and it's high in France. This discontent, Imagine not being, I can think of myself, imagine not being able to get a full-time job in a career that you choose from age 25 to 35. It then becomes vastly more difficult. In fact, you lose a good portion of your future earnings ever by not getting started. It's very difficult to find an entry-level job when you're 37 or 38 or 40. So the notion that the euro, let's take a look here. I just want to take a brief one here. This is a French consumer confidence. Going back to 1980. An imprecise measure, I'm sure. But you can see, except for this recent blip here, what we're talking about. This chart moves from left to right, from high to low. The a national economic policy that permits this type or that fosters this type of economic disparity is one that cannot last, or at least it's one that will be severely questioned as it is being so now. We are taking France, uh, the purple line here is, a, is an annual moving average. It's a monthly number. The The inability of the euro to deliver a positive economic environment across the European Union, or at least across the European Monetary Union, is an Achilles heel like no other for a economic a monetary union. The only reason for German I mean my guess is the only reason Greece didn't leave the euro is that the alternative was impossible. So is if we take that point of view we take that idea that Italy won't leave because there would be too much dislocation. France won't leave because it'll be too much dislocation. Portugal and Spain also. So if we take it as a given that the very difficulty and economic trauma of leaving will prevent the dissolution of the euro, does that somehow elevate the Brussels bureaucracy that sponsors it and that organizes and orders it to the elevation of, I mean, to the level of gathering 
loyalty from its citizens? Hardly. And that's the problem. There are still many, many people in Europe who have come to appreciate the flexibility of politicians who are their own. That it might be better in economic policy to be ruled from Paris and Rome and Berlin and London and Lisbon and Madrid and Athens than from Brussels. This is nothing against Brussels specifically. When the euro started, uh, first in 1999, and then I believe in 2001 as a consumer entity. I remember sitting on the desk, I think I've told people this before, I remember sitting on the desk at the Bank of Bermuda, the currency trading desk, the Tokyo morning, the Asian morning in 1999, January 1st, or January 3rd, I think, when the euro started trading. And it was phenomenally successful. I mean, the currency traders, it's just another set of numbers, another set of calculations. But the market accepted the euro unanimously, immediately. There was no test of normality. There was no trial period. And that was true on the retail side as well, two years later. The European Europeans and the European bureaucracy did a, a very good job of introducing the euro. But at the time, it was said by many of its critics that without a financial entity, without a uniform financial policy, it could not succeed. It would not make Germans more Italian and Italians more German and everybody more French. It did not do, and probably could not, do any of that. So the Europeans are left with a political system for a political problem that no longer really exists. And they are left with an economic system put in place to foster that political system, which is doing exactly the opposite. Amongst large majorities, I'm sorry, large minorities, not majorities yet, at least from we can tell, but, but among large minorities in nations at the heart of the European Union and the European Monetary Union, the euro is destroying or at least damaging the very foundations of European integration and European community. The last polls that I saw, uh, now let's go, let's move to France. If France rejects the Euro, the European Union, the Euro is finished. It may reconstitute itself as some sort of modern day Hanseatic League of currencies. Um, the Hanseatic League was a, <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, uh, early late, late Middle Ages, I think, um, a league of trading uh, Baltic states. Um, I believe it the ran from the North German principalities up to the, uh, the Baltic nations, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Um, that's quite powerful in its day for several hundred years as a trading organization, almost a, uh, you know, customs union or something like that, a free trade zone. The Hanseatic League, look it up. So the Euro could retreat to that sort of Hanseatic League with Germany and some of the other Northern European nations as members, um, which of course is a possibility, but the Euro will not survive the departure of France. Now, does that mean France is gonna leave? No, and I actually don't think it will. 
I don't think have gotten to that point yet. But I also did not think, and I was wrong, that Britain would vote to leave the European Union. I also did not think, although I thought he had a much greater chance of victory than anyone gave him credit for, I am in print saying that before the American election, I did not think that Donald Trump would win. Although I did think, as I say, that he had a much greater chance of winning than he was ever given credit for, which certainly turned out to be true. So the fact that the polls don't show a victory by a uh, overtly anti-EU candidate, um, one, does, are not necessarily reliable, and two, it just means we may have not gotten to the stage yet. But there hasn't been, in, in the past almost decades since the financial crisis, there has not been really any movement, any reform, any either forward or backward into greater integration or not, to the idea that the European Monetary Union as currently constituted not only does not serve the interests of Italy and France and Portugal and Spain and Greece and others, but it does not serve the cause dear to the hearts of bureaucrats in Brussels of European integration. Whatever one may say, and I'm not going to pass judgment on or even comment on it, the approach that Germany took to the Greek debt crisis and the fact that the Greeks borrowed way too much money and they borrowed on German, essentially on German credit right, because of the euro and that all blew up. The reason that this is so dangerous for the European Union, and I've long thought that in the final analysis, when the Europeans come to the negotiations, the nitty gritty, if you will, the negotiations with the UK over the British exit, that a very hard line out of Brussels will be detrimental to the cause of the European Union. It's clear to everyone that the European Union financial arrangements fiscal arrangements across borders will have to change because they are not benefiting. In many cases, they are damaging the economic interests of many of the union's citizens. And the very hard, the problem for the Brussels negotiators in Britain is which one will support the union more, which is of course their concern. A very strict tact against Britain, or a very accommodating one. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure anyone does. The, the strict tact will make people realize that this will never work, but an accommodating tact may make it make them realize that it could very easily leave. So I have no answer. Looks, it appears, at least so far, certainly based on Greece and probably and some of the rhetoric that's come out of the European Union so far that they're going to adopt the Greek method, the method used in the Greek crisis, which is simply to be as harsh as possible. Um, we'll see if that plays out, I don't know. So, on to France. The European Union and the EMU, or maybe the EMU and the European Union, will not survive uh, a anti-EU candidate to the presidency in France. So does that mean that if, let's take the odds favorite now, Emmanuel Macron defeats Marine Le Pen in a runoff, that the European Union is safe? His program, let's take a little, let's take a look at, at some of what some of the candidates are saying. Marine Le Pen um, wants to exit the Euro. She's running somewhere between I think 22 and 24%, depending on the polls, down a trifle, but at this point, 2%, how can you really tell? In the polls, okay, she uh, would exit the euro, restore the French franc. Um, it'd be good for currency trading. 
but I don't know what else. Um, she would suspend the Shergan uh, free travel zone, restore border controls. She would at that point hold a vote on the EU. Exiting the Euro, of course, is simply exiting the EMU. Um, she would reduce illegal immigration and put a 35% tax on the factories that offer jobs. Um, as a program, she represents about a quarter of the polled electorate. But again, the two issues that are most indicative of the effect that the EU and the EMU have had on the lives of the nation state, the lives of people in the nation state, are the euro and its economic effect in France and the Schergen zones and its immigration effect in France. And both of these are probably one and two on Ms. Le Pen's agenda. Emmanuel Macron also running, I believe, about 22 to 24 percent. Um, he would cut there's some interesting, slightly different. His party was originally the Socialists. Um, I'm not sure he'd be called much of a socialist now, but at any rate, um, to cut the corporate tax from 33 to 25 percent. But he would, as a policy, accelerate EU integration by giving the EU both the central parliament, a finance minister, and a budget finance minister. Now, as far as economic logic goes, this is the correct answer for the EU economically. The parliament would give would be an active democratic institution, I'm assuming, I don't know the details of this plan, representing European citizens. And it would begin to take all sorts of powers. And if you're talking about a budget, a finance minister would take the most important powers, economic powers, from the central governments in Europe. My guess at this point is Ms. Le Pen and her supporters are not the only ones who are going to have questions about this. For the nations of Europe, they have seen how the EU works. It's dominated by France and Germany, and primarily Germany, because Germany has the money. Are there, is there going to be trepidation that the EU parliament will operate in exactly the same fashion as an extension of the German government. Now, partly that is unfair because after all, the Bundesbank and the German government, but mainly the Bundesbank was dead set against Europe, the ECB, the central bank in Europe from buying sovereign debt, yet it did. So clearly it's not only beholden to Berlin. But my guess is the developments of the last decade, the events of the last day, decade, although it may not be voiced because officially in almost all the ruling parties in Europe, certainly in most of the governments and government bureaucracies, the faith in the euro has not officially or publicly been denied in European integration. So Mr. Macron is the only one who is advocating European integration. The only one in France. So you, this is not an election without choices. Next, Francois Fillon, who was, yes, a generation ago would have been called a Gaullist. Um, he is, I believe, around 18% last time I, I saw. Um, the polls are pretty friable, the election's only in a week. He would, in fact, shrink the state and cut 500,000 public sector jobs, reduce spending, scrap the 35-hour work week. Um, he would also ban an Islamic swimsuit, which may have resonance, I'm not sure how. 
and reduce immigration. That's sort of almost, if you will, not the classically, but the close to classically uh, conservative viewpoint. And then we have, uh, he is, has lost again. He was running uh, originally before that family about his family um, uh, jobs hit, was running even with Le Pen, essentially. Now, Le Pen's vote hasn't changed. You think about uh, the dangerous thing we about the French election. About a third of the people, according to the polls, say they have not decided who they're going to vote for. That's a large number at this very late state stage of the election. Then we have Jean-Luc Mélenchon. I certainly hope that pronunciation is not too bizarre. Um, I should get my daughters to fix that for me. He is a leftist. I mean, a real leftist. He would spend money, put in a Um, but, but the interesting thing about him is the point of view he takes on the euro and the EU. It is similar. He would not outright reject the euro, but he would renegotiate, this is what he's calling for in his political campaign, the EU treaties. He would get rid of the Maastricht financial the fiscal discipline, which kind of seems almost without point since it's already been eliminated for almost everybody. Nobody's obeying it anyway, 3% debt, let remember that. And he would renegotiate the terms of the EU. With who? <laughs> Is the question. With the EU bureaucracy? With the other 27 members, who do you renegotiate with? Because if he gets, if he's elected, he's running um, about 17 or 18 percent right now, I think. So he is just behind, or ahead of, nobody's really sure, Francois Fillon. So he would be in third place. In order to make, now we all know that the French election is a two stage process. The two, um, Frontrunners in the first election in a week, then have a runoff. So, Mr. Mélenchon, I better should call him Jean Luc since I can pronounce that, um, would need to gain about uh, six, five or six or seven points, depending, uh, say five points, to make it into that second runoff. But there is, and he, you know, much as when Donald Trump was running in the United States and the energy of the crowds, the campaign was all with Trump and it was not with Hillary Clinton. Well, you're seeing something like that in France. The energy is with Jean-Luc, not Jean-Luc Picard. I haven't watched that, but that's another, another topic, another Jean-Luc. Um, so it is more than possible that these poll numbers are not sufficient. So it is well within the realm of possibilities. And then there's a, a fifth candidate named Benoit Harmon, who I think is. Now, the thing about Mr. Jean Luc's, Mr. Jean Luc's, sorry, uh, Jean Luc's, uh, then in the past several weeks, it has risen about 5%, 5 or 6%, from around 12%, according to these polls, to 17 or 18%. Now, that's a very, very large move in the national election at the stage of the election. So it is quite possible that the momentum, such as it is in its five way election, and then there's uh, Benoit Armand, I don't, whose basic, his basic idea is universal basic income for everybody, but it's nice, but he's traveling everybody. So we have basically four candidates within striking distance of the runaway. We have four candidates with very different prescriptions, two of which are overtly or implicitly anti-EU. So it is possible. I won't say likely yet, but possible that the two contenders in the runoff 
are Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, both of whom are, as I said, either overtly or implicitly anti-Euro. So the question that we asked in the beginning, we now answered largely, what happened in France at the heart of the European Union to bring about this change? We're almost four, more than 40% of the population in a poll prior to election. We don't know the actual numbers yet. It could be 50. Are voting for either directly or very close to directly the end of the euro. This is an astonishing development. It is an object lesson in identity and politics and culture. Whatever result we see from this election, I think one thing is certain. If the odds, betting odds, assert themselves, that the election runoff is between Le Pen and Macron, and Macron wins by you know, 50 or 55 or 60 percent, whatever it is, and the official line of supporting the euro and increasing European integration continues, is ascending world French politics. I think that's almost an irrelevancy. Because if the economic policies don't change. And I do not think that there would be any success at this point. I don't know how Germany would feel about it, but there are plenty of other nations who would not participate building a central government in Brussels. Taking the budget and the finance ministry functions away from the national governments and giving them to Brussels, to an elected central parliament. I do not see the European parliaments, the European governments, giving away their own powers to Brussels. So what we're going to see, even if Let's, let's take some assumptions here. Le Pen and Macron are in the election. Macron wins. Two, one of two things will happen at that point. He will try to carry out his accelerate EU integration plans. And let's take it one step further, say if he's successful. What will result in Europe be? Well, it's likely to be more of what we've seen in the past an economic, de continuing economic degradation of many of the countries, non-German countries in the EU. And what will be the result of that? Well, the result will be that the EU and the Euro become ever more unpopular. And that this issue will be revisited in the future election. Let's say that Mr. Macron wins, but does not really promote or is blocked by other nations. After all, you've got 27 nations that have to agree to this. How easy is it to 28 nations? How easy is it to negotiate a political treaty giving away their own power of national government to a central government in Brussels? Difficult? Which is putting it very, very mildly. So let's say that Macron wins and then abandons, essentially, regardless of what the actual rhetoric but abandons the goal of the European because it's probably infeasible, unfeasible, the goal of increased economic integration and political integration in Brussels. So what happens then? Well, the euro continues on its own, as it is, currently constituted. And what can we expect from that? Well, we get more of the same, which means under either scenario, 
the euro is unlikely to begin providing tangible economic benefits to the populations, some of the many of the populations under its control. So if the ECB as the emblem of the euro, the organization behind the euro, cannot provide youth unemployment in Italy and France, cannot assist Italy in, pay, in paying on and getting reducing some of its debt load by, if nothing else, economic growth. Like in Italy had, essentially hasn't grown since the advent of the euro. If it can't help reduce unemployment, youth unemployment, 25 to 35 year olds in Germany, in, not Germany, but in France, in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal then its future will almost necessarily be limited. So this is my final point. The, however this election, it turns out in France, the Euro has gone to the barricades. Nothing will ever be the same after this election because at the very least, there is going to be a very large plurality, it seems, in a nation at the center of the European Union and the Euro and the EMU and the ECB to rethink, redo, or eliminate the United Currency. So whatever this election's result is, It's likely that nothing in the political and economic sphere will ever be the same on the continent. Okay, folks, I thank you very much for attending. I hope this has been useful, instructive, and perhaps illuminating. Um, we are going to have, with the connection of Essex Street, a panel on this same topic on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Um, a all welcome and indeed invited to enjoy to uh, attend. This is the topic du jour, du week, and du month uh, in Europe and in economic and political thought. So I thank you very much for attending and hope you can join us at the same time on Wednesday. Everyone take care and have a good day.